Welcome, everybody. I'm privileged to talk to you all this evening about something that's important to me and about one of the most uh, painful conditions known in medicine. It's often quoted as being worse than childbirth, worse than a kidney stone, worse than traumatic amputation. And it's often mistreated by well-meaning uh, but ignorant healthcare professionals. And then I'm going to I'm going to talk a lot about the man um, that showed the world how to cure this horrible pain. And I think that's a really important part of the story. So <clears throat> hopefully at the end of this, uh, everyone listening will know as much, if not more, than uh, the world of medicine does about this problem called trigeminal neuralgia. So first, uh, I'm going to apologize. I'm getting to the age where I have a little bit of a story about everything, and I might digress a little bit, but I, I wanted to tell you a little bit about me. My my parents immigrated from India. My dad came to the U.S. in 1957. I was born and raised in Northern California. I went to Mariloma High School, and uh, the only claim to fame Mariloma has now, so there was this documentary, and it's a great documentary. If you haven't watched it, it's called Free Solo about this gentleman, Alex Honholt, that uh, scaled El Capitan in Yosemite. So it's uh, it's really worthwhile watching, but he he's an uh, alumni from uh, my high school, too. And from there, <clears throat> um, I got a lot of lu lucky breaks that led me down this path. So uh, my first really lucky break um, was getting selected in the six-year program uh, at Boston University, where I did my undergrad and uh, medical school. So in case you're not familiar, after you finish medical school, you have to go for training. Training is called a residency. So first year of residency is your internship, and then you carry on and finish your residency. And depending on the specialty you pick, residencies uh, vary in length. So neurosurgery is is was the longest at the time, seven-year residency. So the way it works is uh, towards the end of med school, you visit all the residency programs and uh, you interview and you rank them from one to 10 or 20, however you meant, went to. And then they rank you, they rank all the, the interviewees and it goes into a computer and it's called the match. And before you even know the result, you're signing a contract that that's where you're gonna go. So You've got no idea how it's going to work out. And I was extremely lucky to match to my top choice University of Pittsburgh, um, where Dr. Janetta was the chairman. So I was there in Pittsburgh from 1990 to 1997. You know, some of these numbers um, will come, um, will, will be, uh, uh, you'll understand them more um, as I go on. But in, in, that, in that time, you know, he was really the only person doing a lot of this work. So on his operative days, there would be five rooms running. And in the in the single day, uh, we as a team would um, would do 15 uh, uh, surgeries for trigeminal neuralgia. And it was a really exciting time. The other thing that made Pittsburgh exciting at the time, it was the transplant program of the world. So all of the immunosuppressive therapies that uh, put uh, kidney transplant and liver transplant in the modern day medicine that Dr. Starzl uh, uh, came up with was happening at the same time in Pittsburgh. So it was an extremely vibrant place and I was lucky to be there. The next stroke of luck came uh, in 1996. Dr. Janetta was uh, the honored guest at our world meeting in uh, Montreal and all his alumni uh, residency uh, uh, residents were there. And at a cocktail party, I met the first resident that Dr. Janetta trained when he took on the chairmanship at, at Pittsburgh, and that was Dr. Abbasi. So uh, I was chief resident, and uh, Dr. Abbasi uh, and I got introduced by another professor, and he looked at me and he said, are you looking for a job? And I said, I was. And that uh, ended up me joining him in in Springfield. So I came to Springfield in 1997. I've been here ever since. A year later, I recruited my co-resident, Dr. Comey, 
And a couple of years after that, we recruited our junior resident, Dr. McLaughlin. So at one point, the entire neurosurgical workforce of the area were University of Pittsburgh graduates. And so during that time, I've, I've served Shriners and Bay State and Mercy and Holyoke and all the hospitals in the Valley. Uh, who I really want to spend some time talking about is Dr. Janetta. And I can't say enough about him, and I hopefully that comes through with a number of slides going forward. He was the pioneering neurosurgeon with the operating microscope that showed the world how to treat this horrible problem, trigeminal neuralgia. Um, the microscope was not used in the operating room until uh, the 60s, and he was the first to explore the back of the skull, the area called the posterior fossa and to promote this idea uh, that we'll talk about further, that the blood vessel pressing on a nerve can cause a big problem. He also uh, was the type of leader that um, was more interested in uplifting everyone around him and not being the, in any way the star of the show. So the residents around him, um, a lot of them became chairman in their own right, and one of his residents, uh, Dr. Lunsford, went to Sweden and uh, saw this uh, machine called the Gamma Knife and convinced Dr. Janetta to bring that to North America. So the first Gamma Knife in North America came with uh, Dr. Lunsford under Dr. Uh, Janetta's chairmanship, and the Gamma Knife revolutionized neurosurgery the first CT scanner ever in an operating room, and a lot of excellence in areas of skull-based surgery. He also served for a time as the Secretary of Health in Pennsylvania. Um, this is, this is uh, absolutely on the mark regarding him. He was very uncomfortable in the spotlight, and he really thought it was about everyone around him. Um, he passed away in 2016, and ever since that time, there's been some things written. And one of the very interesting papers was by Dr. Kaufman, uh, who was briefly at Pittsburgh. He's in Canada now, and he wrote a history of the Janetta procedure. I want to read. I want to read this uh, slide. It's busy, but I would like to read it because it's it shows you where we came from. So, Dr. Janetta was a resident at UCLA, and uh, his mentors there, uh, Bob Rand and, and Ted Kersey, were the first to start using an operating microscope. Um, Dr. Janetta came up with this idea, but they, they forbid him from doing it at UCLA. They thought it was just a rash and a crazy operation. So, um, uh, he packed up the microscope in his 57 Ford station wagon and drove it to a neighboring hospital. And that's actually where the first surgery was performed. This is a view in the operating room. And this is the operating microscope. It's about a $750,000 piece of equipment, but what it allows is uh, illumination, very bright light, and magnification, and full freedom of movement. And this is this is the tool that revolutionized uh, uh, modern-day neurosurgery and what Dr. Janetta used to make this statement during that surgery when Dr. Alksney was looking and assisting. Dr. Janetta noted uh, artery crossing the trigeminal nerve. And he said, that's the cause of tick. So trigeminal neuralgia uh, also in the past has been called tic de la Rue. I'm going to, I'm going to take, uh, it's a, about five minutes for me to read this. It's not all here, but it's going to lay the groundwork of what's coming up about trigeminal neuralgia. And this was, this was written in JAMA by uh, Dr. Lundberg. He was the director emeritus of the National Library of Medicine, National Institute of Health. 
I've never forgotten a patient I encountered in Arizona 60 years ago. He was a healthy appearing middle-aged rancher. He had lost his wife, but held on to his ranch with the kind of determination that work demands. His daughter was an undergraduate at university. He was proud of her and determined to see her graduate. On his orderly life lay a threat. Sometimes, like many people, he thought of the pain as a perhaps a kind of retribution, perhaps for a failure to move, more thoroughly cherish his wife, perhaps for another deeper failing. In any event, the pains that came over his face and head were terrible. They seemed harder to bear and stronger than any that would be warranted by a fair God, even if it sent down upon an unrepentant murderer. Other patients with this ailment had freely confessed to planning suicide. My patient did not. He did refuse the doctor's offer of surgery to sever the facial nerve as high up as possible. Until, that is, his doctor had completed her, her coursework at the university. Meanwhile, he treated himself in the recurring and damning pain as best he could by repeatedly applying a hot electric iron to his face. This seemed to alleviate the pain of the tick, but his treatment left multiple deep scars in the shape of the iron that I will never forget. The patient taught me yet one more indelible lesson, namely, if a patient says, quote, I'll die if you operate on me, unquote, do not operate. We did. He did. I did the autopsy that revealed no explanation for the surgical death. Even though a vivid memory, I've not thought of this patient in many years, but his image rose up when I read in the New York Times the obit for Peter Janetta. Dr. Janetta practiced medicine as a neurosurgeon, I suppose with ordinary good training, but with extraordinary curiosity. He observed in one patient with tic de la Roe, an anatomical feature that had not been seen by all the physicians or anatomists in the centuries of opportunity to study these cases. The odd feature was the presence of a small blood vessel pressing on the trigeminal nerve. That very same nerve that obviously conveyed the ghastly sense of pain to my patient and to all the others. Of course, it's imaginable that another observer might have seen the groove in the nerve laid down by the encroaching vessel, but it's sure that no one else braved the ridicule and criticism that blew up against Janetta for daring to propose a new idea in the practice of medicine. Dr. Janetta's idea of the tiny vessel causing such agony in the patient merely by pressing against the trigeminal nerve spawned yet another suspect and unpopular idea, namely that the surgeon who attempted to alleviate the anatomic abnormality within the head would need to look at it through a dissecting microscope. Not a fundamentally strange idea in itself, to be sure. In the world of operating rooms and surgeons, however, it was something close to bizarre. I recall as an undergraduate biologist at Amherst College talking to men who in former years as students in this very lab learned to use dissecting microscopes in experimental animal work, but who do not did not dare to use them in the clinical operating room. People would think I was losing my sight, they said. Well, Janetta must have been built to tougher stuff. The surgical procedure he worked at over time and with some help to move or pad the vessel cured the terrible pain of tick. This demanded surgery in a confined and dangerous part of the brain the cerebellopontine space. Yet one more reason for more senior and more conservative, co conservative colleagues to stand in the way. Nonetheless, I personally rejoice that a keen and curious physician devised a cure for tick. For my part, I confess no contribution here whatsoever, but this is the secret of medical progress. The ailment may have lasted well known for a thousand years, but the fortunate hands of modern physicians can and do find cures based on the same old oath of Hippocrates, their curiosity, skill, and a little bit of luck.
So let's dig in a little bit about the medical side of trigeminal neuralgia. So face pain. There's trigeminal neuralgia, and then there's everything else. You can call it a typical trigeminal neuralgia, a typical face pain, a bad tooth. But classic, typical trigeminal neuralgia, the diagnosis is made by the patient's story. As I've said before, it's a pain that is described as among the worst known to mankind. It, in the old medical literature, it was called the suicide disease. It's an excruciating, excruciating lightning strike of pain. It's intermittent, comes and goes. It's not constant, not burning. It has a memorable onset. People remember exactly where they were and what they were doing when it first hit them. It has triggers, talking, eating, brushing the teeth, wind hitting the face will trigger these jolts. And once finally a patient comes in contact with a doctor that diagnoses it correctly, you usually have an excellent response to medication. So I pulled this out of uh, one of the medical papers regarding the question, is there a test of some sort to tell if you've got trigeminal neuralgia? And the answer is no. This is a condition diagnosed almost entirely by the patient's described symptoms and by ruling out other sources. Doctors take a MRI when we suspect it to make sure it's not multiple sclerosis or a tumor, but it's not a way to see if anything is ir irritating the nerve. And that's why I'll, I'll digress and say, Many times MRI reports and the radiologist reports are really useless because I'll just be blunt, many of them don't know what they're looking for when it comes to MRIs for trigeminal neuralgia. I spend a lot of time when I see a patient just digging and probing to their answers to my questions because the story matters. I ask them to describe it to me as if they were talking to a 10-year-old. And the reason that's important is what works for classic trigeminal neuralgia does a very poor job of helping other types of, of pain. So as I said, people will come to me and they'll say, well, I'll, you know, I'm here because I have trigeminal neuralgia. And the first thing I do is say, well, forget that nerve, forget that term. Don't use any medical terms and just talk to me like I'm a, a young a 10 year old and describe exactly what you feel. And then the story becomes clear. It's commonly this horrible jab, shock, taser. And sometimes if they're having an attack, the, the talking will trigger it. They'll stop, they'll whisper, they'll wince. Usually patients are very healthy. Usually they arrive at the diagnosis in very roundabout ways. I treated a patient a number of years ago from Connecticut. She had all the teeth extracted on one side of her mouth by four separate oral surgeons before the fifth one said, oh, maybe it's not your teeth. Maybe it's trigeminal neuralgia. And I ultimately operated on her and she did very well. But she, I, afterwards, she was so sad. She said, look what I went through before we figured things out. Usually the dentist is people's first stop and um, it's becoming less common, but I would say up until about five years ago, just about every patient I saw had some unnecessary dental work they had a root canal or some extraction thinking that that was going to cure their pain when after all it was trigeminal neuralgia. The cause. So we'll look into this in the operating microscope in a minute. But if you don't have multiple sclerosis and you don't have a tumor, the cause of trigeminal neuralgia is a normal blood vessel. It can be a nerve, it can be a vein, it can be an artery, but it's usually the artery. The classic is the superior cerebellar artery against the trigeminal nerve where it exits the brainstem. And this is what Dr. Janetta described in 1967 
And then the firestorm against him erupted because this was just a crazy idea that a normal artery and a normal nerve couldn't live happily ever after. Secondly, a really difficult operation. So he had uh, such a battle. And uh, I really do cause it a, call it a battle because the papers that were written against him, uh, they, they got very personal that he was just some sort of quack. But prominent people came, learned the operation from him. He wasn't interested in keeping it to himself. He wanted to help people. And here, fast forward, treatment of choice worldwide for this problem. An MRI is like putting your head through a bread slicer and looking at a slice of the brain. This is the pons. This is a slice through the posterior fossa. The pons is part of the brain stem. This is the left trigeminal nerve. We look at these upside down. So you're looking at this slice from the feet up. This is the left trigeminal nerve. This is the right trigeminal nerve and flowing blood is like a black circle. You can see where those white arrows are. That's the blood vessel deforming the trigeminal nerve. Now that's the classic MRI appearance for vascular compression causing trigeminal neuralgia. Another common cause and one that I see a lot of is multiple sclerosis. Many patients with multiple sclerosis have trigeminal neuralgia different problem. They don't have the blood vessel against the nerve. They have these plaques that form in the brainstem that somehow disrupts the myelin sheath. So once you're diagnosed, the first line of treatment is medication. And the gold standard medication is Tegretol, the chemical name being carbamazepine. Now there are newer variations of it, but that's still the tried and true gold standard. And it works. If I really dig into people that have trigeminal neuralgia, it worked. They might have not liked the way they felt on it. They may have side effects from it. It may not be effective long term because people have to take more and more, but medication can help. When medications fail, now people have a problem they can't live with. It's not a pain you can live with. And that's where surgical options come into play. Microvascular decompression, uh, now after Dr. Janetta's death is called the Janetta procedure, is the only option that gets to the cause, meaning the blood vessel against the nerve, and offers a cure in patients that don't have multiple sclerosis or a tumor as a cause. There are other options. There are other treatments. But this is the only one with curative effect. And this is what it looks like. So this is just a brief video of me. Uh, of, of, I took a video of pieces of the operation. Um, this is the patient's right ear. This is about a, I'd say about a five centimeter, two and a half inch incision behind the ear. I see sometimes on Google or YouTube, people have these huge, long S shapes, like uh, massive incisions. It doesn't have to be done through a big, big incision. It's a small incision. You make a small window in the skull, and I will play this video then. These are the Teflon pledgets that we put between the artery and the nerve. This is under the microscope. It's two-dimensional, so you're not getting a feeling of depth, but working distance here when I get to the nerve is about six inches. So you, you lose that dimension here uh, because it's two-dimensional. So this is dissecting the membranes around the brain, the arachnoid membrane. Um, this is a very common vein that's in the way of us getting to the nerve. This is the petrosal vein, so using uh, bipolar forceps and cautery, we take down this vein. And then once we take down this vein, there's some micro scissors that will come in the field here. And I slide around the cerebellum. 
This is the trigeminal nerve here, the superior cerebellar artery being lifted away from the nerve, and a piece of Teflon pledget being placed between the artery and the nerve. So that's a, a quick version of what's involved with the operation. Just some pictures of different types of compression. So again, the trigeminal nerve, you can see this artery kinking the nerve there. So here you can see the superior cerebellar arteries as it's coursing in front of the trigeminal nerve. It's actually grooved the nerve. And this was probably the most dramatic uh, example recently of the artery just grooving the nerve. You can see this. This is the superior cerebellar artery right here, taking a U-shaped turn. And you can see that artery through this nerve. And that's the cause of trigeminal neuralgia. This is the side of the pons. So there's it's a, there's a lot of important real estate in this area, but it gives you an idea of where we're working. In terms of dimension, this instrument here that I have my pointer on is about a one and a half millimeter length tool. Dr. Janetta and the team at Pittsburgh published his 20-year data in the New England Journal in 1996, and it showed about a 70% long-term excellent result, pain-free without any, any medication. The conclusion of the paper being that is a safe and effective treatment with a high rate of long-term success. So I, um, I left Pittsburgh and I had this uh, great uh, mentor and uh, I learned this operation and I was doing it here in Pittsburgh in uh, Springfield. And at some point, I kind of wondered how I was doing. Um, I hadn't really, you tend not to really know how you're doing until you critically look at your own data. And what spurred me to look at my own data was a little bit of ego. So this was 2014. I was reading the journal Neurosurgery, and I came across this article by um, the group at the uh, the uh, UCLA School of the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA, and they they published this paper on the value based neurosurgery, the example of microvascular decompression, and they were showing how how well they were doing and and the um, protocols that they had set in place. So they reported that over five years they had operated on forty nine patients, that their average uh, time uh, in the operating room was six hours and that the operative time was close to four hours and the average length of stay was uh, a little over three days. And they, they were having the usual results, good results. But I thought to myself, I said, geez, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm doing better than that. And uh, again, uh, Ego plays a factor in things. So thanks to the uh, help of some of my colleagues, I looked at my data and it's not, it's not nice to report a paper that says I'm doing better than you, but the angle that I played was, well, I'm not UCLA. I'm just this little country neurosurgeon in Springfield at a community hospital where uh, things are a lot less expensive. And that's a factor in medicine. So I said, well, let's look at more than just outcomes. How well can we do this in a community hospital setting? And I, I got this paper um, published at our, our world meeting in Boston. But as opposed to the UCLA group, uh, in five years, I had operated on 59 patients with an average surgical time of 109 minutes and a length of stay of 2.3 days. So 
I felt good. I felt really good because I was doing a good job. And at the time, I was doing a significant percentage of the of the cases in the U.S. So now we'll move to other treatments and alternatives. And I'll tell people about the Genetta procedure and they'll look at me and they say, there's no way I'm letting anybody root around my brain. Or I find a patient that's just not healthy enough for an operation. Uh, age is not a factor. I, I operated on a 92 year old woman from New York who still drove, was still working at a hospital, very, very uh, spry, uh, vigorous lady. So it wasn't a matter of age, it's a matter of health. Also, people with MS, the genetic procedure is not appropriate. So the second line treatment that we do is something called a glycerol rhizotomy. Um, I could do a whole uh, talk on glycerol and uh, its accidental discovery in medicine. Another accident, just like penicillin, but uh, this alcohol called glycerol was magically found to take the pain of trigeminal neuralgia away with very little risk of numbness. There, there are other types of procedures that can be done at the uh, end of a needle, but they all cause numbness, like uh, radiofrequency procedures or balloon compression. Glycerol has a very low risk of numbness. And um, this is an x-ray here. This is a picture in the operating room. It, it looks um, dramatic. It's surprisingly not. Uh, almost with little pain, you can pass a needle through the cheek, by the jawbone, through the base of the skull. So right now here, the tip of the needle is inside the skull. And this, this area that looks like a coffee cup here or a teacup, that's where I've injected the contrast dye around the trigeminal ganglion, where before it branches into three different branches. And once I get the needle in the right spot confirmed by this dye, I inject this glycerol and it really works well. Um, it can take up to two weeks to soak into the nerve and take care of pain. The downside of it with 100% certainty, pain will come back. It's not curative. You can get very good long-term results, but it's not curative. Third option, the gamma knife, radio surgery. So I will talk about this a little bit. The gamma knife revolutionized neurosurgery for treatment of many things, acoustic neuromas, arterial venous malformations, cancer spread to the brain. But not every one of Dr. Janetta's patients was cured. So Dr. Lunsford, who I'll talk about in a moment, who brought the first gamma knife to North America, he asked Dr. Janetta if he would mind treating some of the failed uh, the patients that didn't get better after uh, 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 the Janetta procedure. And um, he had some success. So the, the gamma knife involves uh, cobalt 60 sources that go through these small circles of metal collimators. And these beams all converge on one single point. And you can move that point precisely in the brain and then target a dose right to the trigeminal nerve. And I'll show you in the next slide what that looks like. So uh, another famous figure in neurosurgery, Lars Lexell, he's a Swedish neurosurgeon. Dr. Lunsford, uh, when he was a resident at Pittsburgh under Genetta, went to Sweden to learn from Lexell. He uh, convinces Dr. Genetta to bring the gamma knife to North America. This is the frame that um, is bolted to the patient's skull. And uh, you can see this lady is smiling. It's uh, done under local anesthesia and I haven't had it bolted to my head, but I understand that it is tolerable for the day you need the procedure. Once you have this frame around your head, it 
it uh, overlays a coordinate system that can target a particular point. You have a scan of your brain, and then you go into the gamma knife machine. These are the collimators that focus the beam. And this large machine is Dr. Lunsford treating someone at the University of Pittsburgh. It's an alternative. It's an alternative for patients uh, that uh, might not be candidates for other procedures. There's a little bit longer lag time. Um, if you have a gamma knife today, it can take on the average of three months to kick in and work. It doesn't have the longevity that we originally thought. It can cause numbness, should cause numbness if the nerve's targeted correctly. And certainly if you have a second uh, treatment, um, you'll get numb. That's a reasonable tool in our armamentarium. So that kind of finishes the, the treatments available now for trigeminal neuralgia. Once you're diagnosed, again, from the patient's story, medications, the genetic procedure, various rhizotomy procedures. I do a glycerol rhizotomy, gamma knife radiosurgery. Um, Dr. Janetta was a really good banjo player. He used to play at Shakey's Pizza Parlors in Southern California. So he wrote this song, Tick to the Loo, Tick to the Roo, My Darling, to the tune of Skip to the Loo. And I don't think any younger members of the audience will know how to sing Skip to, Skip to My Lou. And I'm not going to sing it for you, but that's a song he wrote about it. It's quite, quite cute. Um, I can't emphasize enough uh, what a huge figure in neurosurgery was and uh, what a impact this made. And uh, thankfully, um, a lot of a lot of people's lives and work are celebrated after they're dead. In Dr. Janetta's case, um, there was a huge event celebrating his accomplishments uh, while he was alive in, in 2007. He passed away in 2016. And he was very much alive, and uh, it was a very nice event, very well attended. Um, Maya Angelou actually gave the uh, keynote speech. They were friends in the Horatio Alger Society. And um, Sue, I think we have a good amount of time. I was going to show this uh, video now uh, that they showed at this event, if that's okay. Yeah, definitely. Um... There are a couple of questions in the queue, but some of them have been answered during your talk. There might be at least one question that you might want to answer. Sure. Um, it's uh, from one of the attendees. What other padding has been tried other than the Teflon pledge it, if any? Uh, oh, good question. Yeah, so uh, again, history... There's there's so much you can dig into history. Uh, my understanding, the first thing Dr. Janetta tried was a piece of muscle. Um, when you when you operate in that area, you run into a little muscle. So he took a little piece of muscle and put that, but that didn't uh, work out. It kind of disintegrated. The next thing he tried was something called a Ivalon sponge. And that really scarred in place. It was difficult to manipulate and it just became a rock. So uh, what he settled on was Teflon. Um, it comes in a, it looks like a felt. It's like a pad of felt. And we just take a little um, uh, tweezer basically and pull it apart and roll it between our fingers. And we make these little Q-tips tight, like the tip of a Q-tip, various sizes. And um the other thing that people always ask me is, well, how could it doesn't move? I mean, how, how do you know it's not going to float away? All I can say is it just doesn't. You know, it's wedged in there. There's a, I think there's a natural tendency for the artery to move back in place. So you're wedging this thing between the artery and the nerve. And knock wood in 30 years, I've never seen one floating around somebody's head. So they don't move. They don't move. Excellent. Um, 
All right. Well, if you want to uh, show that video, I think all right. Let me let me pl let me play that, and then if it carries on and people want to carry on with their dinner, but it was a pleasure. Uh, I'm glad I had a chance to talk to everybody, and Excellent I'm gonna talk. now I'm gonna I'll take a break and watch this too. He's really been a seminal influence in my life. He's got this charisma, this presence that affects you very profoundly and it makes you, I think, a better individual. And I think that's what great leaders can do. And that's the thing about Peter Janetta. It's the extraordinary character of the man that once you've shaken his hand as a friend, he's your friend for life. He was one of the most influential people in my life. If I can be a fraction of who Peter Janetta is, I'll have led a very successful life. There are not many people in your life that you feel uh, like, I'm glad that I met that person because he had such a profound impact on me. Um, but he's that, he's that kind of a guy. He was so encouraging in so many ways, and I, I just knew that someday I wanted to be the same kind of instructor in neurosurgery that he was, same kind of, same kind of man. Uh, my oldest son is named after my father, and my second son is Peter Joseph. If there's a phrase to describe someone whose theories float outside the realm of accepted, Peter Janetta's heard it. He's colored outside the lines, lived way out there, stood out in left field. But in medical science, there's a fine line between what seems to be crazy and what proves to be brilliant and he's dedicated a lifetime to moving that line again and again. What seemed an outrageous, unthinkable approach to treat trigeminal neuralgia a few years ago has become the gold standard today, all because one surgeon didn't find left field all that daunting, and because he never quit convincing colleagues around the world that they could do more good if they spent a little time out there with him. A boy from South Philly who partly funded his medical education by selling fuller brushes door to door and grew to play a mean banjo might be the last person with the genius and the persistence expected to revolutionize anything, let alone the high wire world of neurosurgery. But as the saying goes, greatness often comes wrapped in unexpected packages. And Peter Janetta is not your everyday revolutionary. Now considered one of the fathers of modern neurosurgery, Dr. Janetta didn't even want to become a neurosurgeon at the start. But once he made the leap to the burgeoning field, he jumped in all the way. He only looked forward, and with a focus that amazed surgeons, even detractors, with twice his experience. Peter Janetta was probably considered among the top five neurosurgeons in the world. I've, I've watched many surgeons over my career operate. Uh, Peter is, is the best or is as good as anybody I've ever seen. He has an efficiency of motion that gets the job done very elegantly and quickly and you don't realize it. You try to emulate the people who are very good. I would say that if you ever watch him operate, it seems almost easy. What he does, it's almost like using his own hands to move things around like a conductor would. When you try to emulate that, you try to do it, you realize that at the beginning how difficult it is. The cranial nerves nestled at the base of the brain regulate a myriad of automatic functions we take for granted. But when a blood vessel presses on one of them, causing a benign sounding condition called trigeminal neuralgia, it triggers an agony beyond words, ultimately making a normal life impossible. And surgeons decreed that going into that netherworld of the brain wasn't worth the risk just to get rid of pain. 
A young neurosurgery resident began down a different path, looking for the cause. During an operation, he found the answer. A blood vessel pressing on the nerve started the pain. Why not permanently hoist the blood vessel up and off the nerve, like a jack props up a car so its owner can change a tire? When it occurred to Dr. Janetta how the problem could be solved, he was in the infancy of his career. A man in his 30s, but still a kid in his profession. One in which newcomers were expected to absorb the status quo, not challenge it. But the kid persisted, confident that he had found what neurosurgeons since the profession began could not. The definitive way to free people from a lifetime shackled by indescribable pain. His tools? A microscope, a steady hand and heart, and a few pieces of felt. It meant going into the base of the brain where the cranial nerves bundled, the tiniest of spaces where the tiniest of wrong moves would paralyze a patient forever or worse. It meant working with a microscope to find the offending blood vessel, which was invisible to the naked eye, then sliding in the scraps of felt to separate it from the nerve. Getting there safely was half the battle. Working there with precision long enough to make the repair seemed out of the question. And it worked, because Peter Janetta believed he could make it work. He actually made an observation of a vessel pressing on the nerve. And he put them together and said, this must be the cause of it. Why can't we move this away? It was not uh, that he was a cowboy. He was just the opposite. He was very thorough, very well read, very conscientious, very dedicated. Uh, but on a mission to improve. The thing that really helped, I think, convince the world was when he moved on to hemifacial spasm, for which we didn't have an operation. And he demonstrated that the same things apply. You move the vessel off the nerve, this muscular twitching in the face goes away, and they don't get any weakness in their face. And all of a sudden, oh my goodness. I mean, this is really something. But in spite of the fact that I was a critic and uh, doubted it, uh, I decided to try it and it was one of the most rewarding experiences of my career because of the relief that I was able to bring to these patients. Dr. Janetta had this um, very, very sincere devotion to this thing he was doing. And then there was a group of neurosurgeons that thought he was a quack and crazy. And I can remember coming back to my own hospital and giving a conference about this. And man, you know, these are my colleagues, my friends, and the, 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 the reaction it created was so intense that I realized at that time what Peter had been going through, trying to convince the world that he was right. The technique, called microvascular decompression, was pure genius. Simple, bold, delicate, and above all, audacious. It flew in the face of tradition. Dr. Genetic continued to perform the procedure despite its novelty. But there were scores of suffering patients, and he was only one surgeon. And he realized that discovery of the technique didn't matter if he couldn't convince his colleagues across the country to perform it. The one thing that, that always impressed me about Peter, though, is the fact that he always took the attitude, if I'm the only guy doing this, it's a gimmick. If, I can, if no one else can do it, then it doesn't have any validity. And so he encouraged patients to come to the other people he had trained to do it. You have people whose lives are shattered. They are considering suicide. Their marriages are falling apart. They can't have relationships. And they're absolutely miserable and you go ahead with this one procedure and you give them their life back. And it's a very special feeling. Breaking scientific barriers demands two kinds of pioneers. The ones who make the discoveries first, then the ones who look over their own shoulders once they get there and make it their life's work to ensure that everyone else can find the route too. Hundreds of his students of yesterday and today from around the world say to a person that Dr. Janetta excels in that latter arena, 
perhaps more than any other, equating their tutelage under his expertise to the words of Isaac Newton, who said that his ability to see farther than others came because he got to stand on the shoulders of a giant. Their giant looked a little different than those of Lore. This one wore scrub. So, Sue, are you still there? Yeah, of course. Okay. Um, ...and told students awed by his professional stature just to call him PJ. For many decades, his broad shoulders provided the foundation for several generations to blossom into great surgeons in their own right. He's a maestro in the operating room, and I think even if I'm a small percentage of what he taught me, that's enough to influence the next generation of neurosurgeons. So he had this ability to make you believe in yourself and to uh, uh, really, you know, expect more. And uh, he was just uh, a great teacher in that regard. He knew his subject so well and he knew how to inspire young men and women. He's a very inspirational man. He has tremendous passion for what he does, tremendous optimism and enthusiasm. And uh, he instills that. It's infectious. Uh, and I think it's uh, evident in, in, in the residents and the fellows that he's trained. There is another well-known department that I visited when I was looking around to find a fellowship. And uh, that was just as pro prominent a neurosurgeon that I visited. And that person in one week probably gave me two minutes of his time. Whereas Janetta took me aside, talked to me. My first name is not an easy first name. And he knew me by my first name from the first day. All those things make a big impact on a person who's just growing up and coming up at that stage of my life. A half century into his career, the record and depth of his accomplishments reflects the work of 10 men and a reach that encircles the globe. A list of publications and lectures long enough to fill a library. Leadership of every known neurosurgical society. Surgical instruments bearing his name. Secretary of Health for Pennsylvania. Chairmanships and academic posts at Allegheny General, the University of Pittsburgh, and prominent universities across the country. Some ask, what's left? And Peter Janetta will probably always reply, what's next? His colleagues will tell you he won't entertain the idea of quitting. Quit just isn't a word in Peter Janetta's vocabulary. His children have gone on to have their children and build their careers, all to their father's delight. His students have gone on to become pioneers in their own right and teach yet another generation of leaders in medicine, all to their teacher's joy. His colleagues have gone on to develop inventive techniques that have further transformed neurosurgery, all to their comrade's gratification. And Peter Janetta, he's where he wants to be the quintessential father on top of the family tree. For this father lives two principles Churchill always talked about, never quit and recognize that we make a life only by what we give. And his patients across the country and around the world say that because Peter Janetta wouldn't quit, he bestowed on them the greatest of all possible gifts. He gave them their lives back. He perfected a craft and taught it to a generation of really young, bright people. And that torch will carry on eternally. He basically has given us techniques that have helped us uh, cure generations of patients of the most devastating, difficult, agonizing pain that anyone can experience, and is uh, a godfather to almost every neurosurgeon in the world. Peter Janetta enjoys life. He enjoys people. He is passionate about what he does. He believes in what he does. He is a man of incredible courage. He looks out for you, takes care of you, asks you how you're doing, and you want to please him. You want to do a good job for him. So he really takes on a role of a father figure. 
and I think that I owe a lot to Dr. Janetta, and I think that it has made me the success that I am today. What's remarkable about him is that he will listen and care about you, whether you're a patient, an employee, a secretary, or another physician. He'll listen and respond to you as a person. It's a remarkable ability. If I had one word to describe Dr. Janetta, it would be a charisma. He was able to convince people that what his vision is should be their vision. You want to do things to please him because you want to please him. I, I do think that people like Peter Janetta make, make life better. I, I think it's a testament to, to the kind of person he is as much as the kind of neurosurgeon he is. I still look up to what he has taught me. I've never forgot, forgotten that. And uh, to a great degree, I feel that today I am what I am because of what he gave me. I'm so happy that I had a chance to interact with him in my life. The greatest lesson he gave to me was to promote the people under you and promote the people around you and give them a leg up whenever you can to help them achieve their dreams. And by doing that, not only do you see your dreams come true, but you see other people's dreams around you come true. And that's a really gratifying thing to see. All right, Sue. Great, <laughs> great. Oh my God, that was that was a really nice video, and I especially loved your talk and your videos of your surgeries. So thank you for helping all of your patients and for this great time and expertise that you shared. We appreciate you. Great, and thanks for. <laughs> we appreciate the audience too. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. <laughs>